good day, everyone. This is your host, Mike Ward, with Kaleidoscope. They said he had the flexibility of an eel, for the lies of a cat, and the bizarre genius that enabled him to sneer at setters. He shed police handcuffs merely by tapping them in the right place. He could release himself from dungeons in less time than it took to lock him up. And for 25 years, he astounded audiences by his escape. He was buried in sealed coffins, sewed up in canvas bags, stuffed into milk cans and beer barrels, even riveted into boilers. He always got out, one way or another. The fifth child of an immigrant rabbi, Eric White, ran away from home in Appleton, Wisconsin at 12, and spent a wandering apprenticeship holding odd jobs as blacksmith's helper, necktie cutter, and locksmith's assistant. Locks fascinated him, and he practiced picking them with a two-inch piece of wire until he knew all their secrets. How did he do it all? A question mark still punctuates any inquiry into his magic art. And we tell you this story on today's program of Kaleidoscope, the story of the great Houdini. Fifteen years of age. The slender youth with steel blue eyes and black curly hair billed himself as Cardo or Eric the Great. To routine sleight of hand illusions with rabbits, silk hats, and playing cards, he gradually added such novelties as wiggling out of trick boxes and slipping free from rope ties. At a country fair, the sheriff drew out a pair of handcuffs and asked, Do you think you could get out of these, Bob? Houdini said, I'll try. He slipped behind a screen and reappeared a minute later with the open handcuffs dangling from his wrist. This trick became the backbone of his act and the basis of his international fame as the Handcuff King. Eric Weiss was 17 when he came across the memoirs of Robert Houdin, and was so impressed that he decided to call himself Houdini and to model himself on a great French magician. And as his fame spread, Houdini entered a sort of non-stop competition with most of the world's jailers, locksmiths, and not experts. The London Daily Mirror challenged him to break out of handcuffs in which a blacksmith had labored for five years. Houdini obliged before a cheering audience of 4,000. In Boston, a sportsman wagered $6,000 that he could tie Houdini securely. He spent 45 minutes squatting the magician from head to foot in hundreds of yards of heavy fish line. It took Houdini an hour and a quarter to wriggle out of this cocoon covered with bruises. Locked naked in a jail cell in Washington, D.C., he was out in two minutes flat. He then proceeded to open other cell doors and change the prisoners around just for the fun of it. He broke into another cell where his clothing had been left and appeared fully dressed in the warden's office just 15 minutes after he had been locked up. Houdini might have become the most dangerous criminal would open an ordinary office safe in no time at all. To solve the more elaborate type of vault lock, he invented a small device which resembled a vault meter. He would merely stand in front of the safe, operate his machine, then presto, pull the door open. Long before his death, he destroyed this machine, fearing it might fall into the hands of unscrupulous persons. <laughs> Ensure 
capacity audiences, Houdini often gave a free public exhibition when beginning a new engagement. One nearly ended in disaster. Houdini was scheduled to leap into the Detroit River and free himself from handcuffs underwater. But on the appointed day, the river was frozen solid. Houdini insisted on going ahead. The workmen cut a hole in the ice. Spectators packed the riverbank while police snapped handcuffs on his wrist. A shout went up as he plunged into the icy water. Tense silence followed as minutes passed. Two, three, four, five. Finally, a rope was lowered into the water, and a diver prepared to go down. But just at that moment, Houdini's head bobbed up through the hole. He had been under the water for eight minutes. Phenomenal muscular control. 
At the age of nine, he could pick up needles from the floor with his eyelids while hanging by his heels. Later, he acquired wonderful control of the muscles of his throat and stomach. This was the basis for one of his most successful tricks, wherein he appeared to swallow a hank of thread and a package of needles, and later brought up 100 needles neatly spaced on 200 yards of thread. Houdini could make his wrists and ankles bigger when shackles were being applied, then relax them to normal size to make his escape. His feet were like a second pair of hands. At dinner parties, he sometimes tied a dozen tight knots in a piece of string, dropped it on the floor, slipped off his shoes and socks, and untied the knots with his toes. He trained like an athlete for underwater escapes. For months, he practiced submerging in a bathtub, timing himself with a stopwatch, gradually increasing his endurance. Not until he was able to stay under for four minutes did he feel ready for public demonstrations. To prepare for immersions in freezing water, he took progressively colder baths until he could climb into an iced tank that would chill a polar bear. For escapes from safes and sealed caskets, he learned to utilize a limited supply of oxygen by breathing very slowly and making no unnecessary movements. My chief task has been to conquer fear, he once said. When I am manacled and nailed securely within a weighted packing case and thrown into the sea, or when I am buried alive under six feet of earth, it's necessary to preserve absolute serenity of spirit. I have no work with great delicacy and lightning speed. If I grow panicky, I am lost. And if something goes wrong, I am lost unless all my faculties are working on high, free from mental strain. The public sees only the thrill of the accomplished trick. They have no conception of the torturous self-training that was necessary to conquer fear. A most remarkable man. Derek White, the public known as Harry Houdini. Surprisingly simple methods were employed by Houdini in many of his stage illusions. For example, his feat of walking through a brick wall. The volunteer union bricklayers would erect, in full view of the audience, a solid brick wall, 10 feet high, 12 feet long, and a foot thick. The foundation of the wall was a steel beam mounted on casters. The beam was scarcely two inches above the floor. Screens were set up on opposite sides of the wall. Underneath the wall was a heavy, seamless rug. A committee of 12 from the audience tested the wall, examined the rug, and made certain there was no way for Houdini to get under, over, or around the obstruction. He then went behind the screen on one side, called out, Now I'm going. And 30 seconds later cried, Here I am, from the other side of the wall. When he called, Now I'm going, Stage hands released a trap door directly beneath the wall, and the rug sagged several inches, enough to let Agile Harry slither under the wall. Yet the trick was performed so cleverly that not even rival magicians hit upon the answer. on the susceptibilities of bereaved widows and desolate parents. And as a lecturer, he demonstrated that he could reproduce all the spirit writing, table lifting, and ghostly apparitions of the mediums. Uh, to any medium giving proof of genuine psychic power, Houdini offered $10,000. And there were plenty of contestants, but no winners. As a member of the Scientific American Committee for the investigation of spiritualism, Houdini played a leading part in laying bare frauds, which had taken from thousands their money and driven more than a few to the madhouse. He exposed the notorious Marjorie of Boston, demonstrating that she obtained her spookiest effects by means of megaphones suspended from wires and by ringing eerie bells 
with a two-foot ruler concealed on her person. Yet while rending this curtain of fraud, Houdini possessed the curiosity about the possibility of communication between the world of the dead and the living. He entrusted certain secret messages to his wife with the understanding that he would try to repeat them after death. which brought Houdini into final disrepute with most of the professional research men in the psychic field was an investigation of the famous physical medium, Marjorie, wife of Dr. L.R.G. Crandon, for 16 years professor of surgery at Harvard University Medical School, conducted by the Scientific American. The investigating committee was composed of impeccable scientists and psychologists, including Gardner Murphy, director of Menninger Foundation. Houdini asked to be added to the committee. Seances continued, the committee became increasingly doubtful of Dini's feeling for the scrupulousness of the whole situation, not to say impartiality, and made public statements of fact. So by that time, Houdini's reputation was at stake. If distinguished men could prove him wrong in his accusations, the whole country would have a chuckle at his expense. And to be laughed at was one thing he could never accept. Moreover, his enemies, the spiritualists, or so he considered them, would also have a field day. Actually, many spiritualists had defended Houdini, being more eager than anyone else to have their ranks cleared of fraud. And so history has reported many stories on the possibility of Houdini coming back to give his answer. Did he or did he not? That if there was anything to claim for survival, he would get through with white Bessie, with a code message which only she could decipher. But this curious last message would have anything to do with the future of a medium, would have seemed a far fetched idea at the time. However, the Houdini virus was contagious, and other magicians also broke out in eruptions against spiritualism and mediumship. Among the best known of all the magicians was a man by the name of Howard Thurston. Thurston was a tall, suave, and handsome man, whom had always been considered a thorough gentleman. Therefore, it was a surprise when in 1927, the old New York world ran a story to the effect that Thurston claimed he had exposed over 300 mediums, that spiritualism had broken up homes, that the old-time saloon, and that he had a gadget resembling a watch case in which he has concealed a rubber spook that could be blown up and operated in such fashion that it could almost duplicate all the phenomena of a seance room. One of the leading mediums of the time was a man whose name was Arthur Ford, and he asked the world to let him answer the story, but the newspaper hierarchy refused. There was nothing particularly newsworthy about Arthur Ford, but the United Press Association indicated that they would carry his reply if he made a good story. Now, how could Ford make a good story of fraudulent accusation of fraud? He thought over the fact that magicians such as Houdini and Thurston kept on issuing open challenges to mediums offering $10,000 for the production of any stunt that could not be reproduced by trickery. Ford felt there had been enough talk and that someone should make some kind of public appearance, someone who would carry some weight. Therefore, when a friend of Ford suggested that he turn the tables and offer $10,000 to Thurston if he could prove his charges, Ford was held back by only 10,000 good reasons. And this was the beginning of Arthur Ford's interest in the answer of Eric White. For many years, Houdini's mother said, my son waited for one word which I was to send back. He always said that if he could get it, he would believe. 
conditions have now developed in the family which make it necessary for me to get my code word through before he can give his wife the code he arranged for her. If the family acts upon my code word, he will be free and able to speak for himself. Mine is the word forgive. Capitalize that and put it in quotation marks. His wife knew the word, and no one else in the world knew of it. Ask her if the word which I've tried to get back all these years is not forgive. i tried innumerable times to say to him, now that he is here with me, I am able to get it through. Tonight I give it to you, and Beatrice Houdini will declare it true. This message was received by Arthur Ford through mediumship, and when he awakened, the group told him about this extra message which had been slipped in. Ford was not much interested. Houdini supposed exposition of mediums, and always the annoyance of them, was paramount in the mind of Ford. He thought of Houdini as a wonderful magician with an otherwise bigoted mind and a colossal conceit, and he didn't care to have anything to do with him. However, the men at the sitting wanted to give Mrs. Houdini her message. Ford particularly valued the judgment of Francis Fast and agreed. Therefore, on the following day, a copy of the message was taken to Mrs. Houdini. She was completely amazed, and as newspaper files attest, made a public statement over her signature that was the sole communication received among thousands up to this time that contained the one secret key word known only to Houdini, his mother, and herself. And so to Mr. Ford she wrote, Today I received a special delivery letter signed by members of the First Spiritualist Church to testify to a purported message from Houdini's mother received through you. Strange that the word forgive is the word Houdini awaited in vain all his life. It was indeed the message for which he always secretly hoped. And if it had been given to him while he was still alive, it would, I know, have changed the entire course of his life. But it came too late. Aside from this, there are one or two trivial inaccuracies. Houdini's mother called him Eric. There was nothing in the message which could be contradicted. I might also say that this is the first message which I have received among thousands, which is an appearance of truth. Sincerely yours, Beatrice Houdini. Well, that one word, forgive, was not the whole of the mother's message to her daughter-in-law, but the rest was of an intimate family nature which concerned Mrs. Houdini and her husband's relatives. In that first seance, the last thing the spirit guide of Ford was purported to say about Houdini's mother was simply, she is going now, and she says that since this message has come through it, it will open a channel for another. The other to which he referred was a pact Houdini had made with his wife. He had sworn to get a message through to her if such a thing as survival should prove real. The message was to be based upon a ten-word code which they had used in one of their early shows and which no one but himself and his wife had ever known. The press had given considerable coverage to this agreement, and in the months following his death, interested persons in various parts of the world were constantly purporting to have received a message from Houdini. And just as regularly, Mrs. Houdini disclaimed the messages. It was a poor month when there was no newspaper mention of Houdini in his code. After the message from Houdini's mother, no further word came for several months. To be sure, no one made any attempt to follow up. Then in November of 1928, the first word of Houdini's own message came through in a sitting for a group of friends, none of who, none of who had known Houdini. The spelling out of the entire message took a portion of eight separate sittings, covering a period of two and a half months. The guide's method for Ford was to announce the word as he got it, no matter what else he happened to be talking about, and then apparently to wait until there was another word and make another opportunity. One night, the spirit guide for Ford announced, the first word is Rosa Bell, and it's going to unlock the rest. A fortnight later, a second word was added, now. A third sitting, the guide said, here is a lady I've been working with for a long time, but the only word I can get from her tonight is look. This is the sixth word of the code. The citizens presumed that the lady to whom he had referred was Houdini's mother. Still later, the guide asked for four new words, and these words were added. Roosevelt, answer, pray, and tell. At the next to the last sitting, the guide said, let me give you the words from the beginning, because I have to work hard at them. His last comment was, this man tells me now that he has put the next five words, which explain these in French. I have not got them yet. I want to give you the other words because working on French words, I may forget the others. 
And so at the final sitting, the guard said, this man who is communicating tells me it has taken him three months working out of the confusion to get these words through, and that at no time has he been able to do anything without his mother's help. Tell. That is the last word. You now have ten words. Go over them carefully. It has been a hard job getting through. But I tell you, he says, fairly shouting, they are right. Now he wants to dictate the exact message you are now having to his wife. The time was asked. It was 9.23 p.m. The guide said that this was to be noted. Also, that the medium was in deep trance. The medium's pulse was at that very moment 63, which he asked to have verified. Also, he wanted the names of those present set down. The guide then continued with great exactness. A man who says he is Harry Houdini, but whose real name was Eric Weiss, is here and wishes to send to his wife, Beatrice Houdini, the ten-word code which he agreed to do if it were possible for him to communicate. He says you are to take this message to her, and upon acceptance of it, he wishes her to follow up the plan they agreed upon before his passing. This is the code. Rosabelle, answer, tell, pray. Answer, look, tell, answer. Answer, tell. He wants this message signed in ink by each one present. He says the code is known only to him and to his wife, and that no one on earth but those two know it. He says there is no danger on that score, and that she must make it public. Announcements must come from her. You are nothing more than agents. He says that when this comes through, there will be a veritable storm, that many will seek to destroy her, and she will be accused of everything that is not good. But she is honest enough to keep the fact which they repeated over and over because before his death. He says, I know that she will be happy because neither of us believes it would be possible. And then the guide added, her husband says that on receipt of this message, she must set a time as soon as possible when she will sit with this instrument while I, the guide, speak to her. As soon as Ford was well into the trance, the guide came again. He said, this man is coming now, the same one who came the other night. He tells me to say hello, best sweetheart. And he wants to repeat the message and finish it for you. He says the code is one that you use for a mind-reading act. He wants you to tell him whether they are right or not. Mrs. Houdini replied, yes, they are. He smiles and says, thank you, now I can go on. He tells you to take off your wedding ring and tell them what Rosabelle means. Drawing her left hand from under the cover, Mrs. Houdini took off the ring and holding it before her, sang in a small voice, Rosabelle, sweet Rosabelle, I love you more than I can tell. For me, you cast a spell. I love you, my Rosabelle. The guide continues, he says, I thank you, darling. The first time I heard you sing that song was in our first show together years ago. Mrs. Houdini nodded her head in a sense. Then there is something he wants me to tell you that no one knows but his wife. Through the guide, Houdini continues on. And now the nine words besides Roosevelt spell a word in our code. Very exactly, he then explained the code. The second word in our code was answer. B is the second letter in the alphabet, so answer stands for B. The fifth word in the code is tell, and the fifth letter of the alphabet is E. The twelfth letter in the alphabet is L. And to make up twelve, you would have to use the first and second words of the code. Continuing in this intricate way to the end, he said, The message I want to send back to my wife is Rosabelle Belize. The guide then asked, is this right? Mrs. Houdini, with great feeling, answered yes. The code had been a handy device employed in Houdini's instructions to his wife during their act. Mrs. Houdini commented that the code was such a secret that even though the stagehands knew the word, no one except Houdini and herself knew the cipher or the key and its application. From the moment that Mrs. Houdini pronounced the message genuine, there began a flood of attack ranging from the ludicrous to the vicious. 
This is Houdini's veracity with questions. She was accused of giving the code to someone who then gave it to Ford. As if there could be any comfort for her in securing a message she already knew from a source that she did not believe existed. She was also scored for selling out to her husband, but so widely publicized his conviction that all mediums were fake. Consistently, she avowed the genuineness of the messages and defended having them public. It was what he wanted me to do, and I am doing it. Ford was likewise accused of fraud, of course. And there was once also an approach by an ingenious blackmailer. Then a man impersonating Ford fabricated a newspaper story, which only one tabloid printed, after which he confessed his hope under promise of immunity from criminal prosecution. Three individuals brought charges to the United Spiritualist League of New York City that Ford had been in cahoots with Mrs. Houdini and the press. The president of the board of the trustees of the church redeemed Ford's character. Mrs. Houdini stood her ground, and the respectable press was meticulously saved. Ford never attempted to collect any of the fabulous sums offered for breaking the Houdini Code, and Ford was sure a legal case could have been made. However, he did not or did receive an enormous amount of publicity. Perhaps Houdini had a hand in that. Ford may have been paying his respects to the fact that his acts had been performed not while handcuffed, but while sound asleep. One bit of evidence. A facsimile of statement made by Mrs. Houdini the day after the receipt of the message. New York City, January 9th, 1929. Regardless of any statement made to the contrary, I wish to declare that the message in its entirety and in the agreed upon sequence given to me by Mr. Ford is the correct message prearranged between Mr. Houdini and myself. Signed, Mr. Houdini. evidence that perhaps something did happen along these lines that we've reported that would indicate that Houdini did get his message through. However, there is one more aspect of the story to report. Houdini died in October of 1926. For ten years, his widow attended hundreds of seances, all without result. In 1936, on the 10th anniversary of his death, she made her last attempt. Amid impressive surroundings, a medium pleaded with Houdini to make his last and greatest escape. But nothing happened. And when the seance was over, Mrs. Houdini said, Houdini has not come. I do not believe he will ever come. For years, she had kept the light burning over a portrait of the great magician and showman. And that night, she turned it off.
evidence of the seances, the evidence given by the medium, and a facsimile in writing that Beatrice Houdini had been given the successful message, or the statement in which she said, Houdini has not come. I do not believe he will ever come. Is it a matter of the will to believe as opposed to the will of not believing? genius that enabled him to sneer at locks and setters. He shed handcuffs merely by tapping them in the right place. He could release himself from dungeons in less time than it took to lock him up. For 25 years, he astounded audiences by his escapes. Many of his feats were learned, the secrets behind these stunts. Many were not. How did he do it? Question marks still punctuate any inquiry into Harry Houdini's magic art. The great Harry Houdini. This is your host, Mike Worth, thanking you for joining me. Extending an invitation to you to be with me again tomorrow at 11.10 a.m. for another Goodwill Station presentation of Kaleidoscope. (laughs) 